Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks to yourself for the uh, description. And the first reaction when I came here was, wow, this is such a long topic, like such a long title. So don't worry, I'll unpack. I'll try to unpack this thing. Uh, it's basically evaluation of the cloud hosting framework for machine learning based equipment monitoring. And each of these uh, words signify, uh, as a company, like what I do, um, what industrial space that we are in and why this is kind of relevant to us. So we kind of connect cloud-based services, like this topic will connect cloud-based services, our kind of a domain expertise in industrial equipment monitoring. And um, this is more like a experience of sorts of, um, if we were to use a cloud-based services, we have so many options out there, uh, like Azure, GCP, uh, AWS. Um, then if we were to make model, so develop models, uh, which framework is kind of the most apt uh, for us. Um, so what I do, I'm a data scientist at Arundo. We are based in Houston. We are a growing company of 100, and uh, we basically provide practical software solutions uh, towards industrial equipments, monitoring, equipment monitoring, um, and provide enterprise-scale machine learning solutions uh, uh, through uh, and analytics. And why this topic? So as a data scientist, sorry, so as a data scientist, um, uh, it is uh, so. It often hap happens that uh, the machine learning solutions that we make are increasingly becoming prevalent in this space of ind high heavy asset industries. So imagine that uh, you have these uh, industries like chemical process, chemical plants, and uh, um, uh, uh, maritime uh, ships, and etc. And there are these large equipments that are kind of expensive, and it is very important that we can we can capture if anything is going wrong well in advance. And in Endeavor to do that, there are these sensors that are attached to it, the IoT sensors that continuously stream data to us. And our goal is to develop solutions around it. And once we develop solutions in-house, and this has to be provided to our end customers who can invoke this and can basically act upon it effectively. So the question then becomes for a data scientist, how easy is it to productionize these machine learning solutions that we have developed in-house uh, and for specific use cases around equipment monitoring, which is time series based streaming data that we, we are getting continuously. Right? So the outline would be um, that um, first I would talk about what is a path to production for the skill set that is perceived to be of a data scientist. And then uh, I'll go on towards machine learning for equipment monitoring in heavy asset industries, like specifically constraining that what are the problems that uh, uh, we face or what kind of data that we face for uh, equipment monitoring. And I'll give an illustration example where we'll try to solve uh, a particular, or where we'll try to deploy a particular model, which is uh, called uh, prediction of anomalous temperatures in alternating winding coil. So alternator is uh, a device where you have three, say, sensors attached to it inside, and there is rotating uh, equipment and they are capturing temperature continuously and we are getting the temperature feed. The question is when does something go wrong in that alternator? And anomaly stands if something is going wrong. Now we'll be comparing three cloud-based services and there's a reason why we do these three and they are GCP, uh, Azure and AWS. And uh, we will have uh, three different deployment scenarios. Um, so just to get a gauge of uh, what kind of audience this is, like how many of you uh, actively do machine learning, deploy machine learning solutions on any of these cloud services? Okay, cool. So for people who wish to like start, uh, if they think that which service they would like to proceed, uh, which, which they like to adopt, this is also like a presentation of those sorts where uh, these are like our experience and uh, it can be like a good starting point for you guys also to see where to start to if you were to use these kinds of services. So we have three different uh, deployment scenarios. Um, when we are de developing machine uh, solutions in Python, we typically use these uh, scikit-learn packages to, which helps us to develop these models. And uh, we will slowly build customizations on the scikit-learn package uh, by attaching some data processing steps before and after this kind of a model prediction stage. And uh, the question then becomes if, as an organization, you are building more and more sophisticated algorithms and packages, do these cloud services still cater to your needs? Um, and if they do, which one is the best and which one is probably controversially the worst? But yeah. Uh, and then we'll have the remarks.
So first one, I will go on to the part two production for data scientists. So this is uh, where I think a chart uh, where we see that if we were in the left-hand side, uh, which is um, if you're a data scientist and uh, you make your machine learning models, you'll use services like Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch, et cetera. Now the when question becomes that if we were to productionize this, we need to get into the nitty gritty stuff of, okay, the environment in which we are making our uh, models should be the same as the one that will be deployed to. And next, then it becomes, okay, we might have to use Docker so that uh, these, everything remains consistent with the engineering code as well, and so on. And so slowly we find that what we started off, we kind of go out of our comfort zone if we, are, if we do not have these skills, and then we go towards machine learning and then slowly to DevOps. Right? So the question then becomes, is it possible to stay in this regime around this and then still be able to deliver value or deploy models easily? Do, the, do these uh, cloud providers expose these high-level APIs to us or not? So next, uh, I will briefly talk about machine learning for equipment monitoring in heavy asset industry. So this is typically uh, a pictorial representation that we have these uh, equipments that have sensors attached to it that is streaming us uh, data. Um, we, have, uh, we process the data because assuming that if equipment is uh, transmitting at some frequency, but we want at a different frequency, then we kind of do some pre-processing. And frequency is just one kind of an example of pre-processing. There can be many other kinds of pre-processing. Um, model predict is basically whatever, there is this black box or model where this data comes in, this pre-processed data, and you do some kind of a prediction outside. Now, these predicted values itself cannot, uh, it not necessarily be usable, and you do some kind of a post-processing, and then you map it to something uh, which is, uh, say, meaningful. So this is really helpful because if, you're, if there is some issue or some problems that are going to encounter in this equipment, you can capture it well in advance. Now, uh, so this, uh, the data that we are going to deal with typically is a time series kind of data, and there is this uh, thing called uh, tags, they call it. Tags are nothing but actual uh, uh, the columns, or actual data that we are receiving. They can be like temperature, pressure, these are some physical quantities in an equipment. Um, also, one thing that we see in our organization is that uh, typically we just don't receive this data and just do this problem. There is some attached uh, subject matter expert input as well. And because we necessarily, as data scientists, we do not belong in that domain and we need some kind of an input that can aid us help make better models. And um, this uh, subject matter expert can also, we are in a scenario where we can affect our modeling decisions. So, now, there are some important logistics in this uh, area of uh, heavy asset, which is that privacy is actually a critical concern for our customers, uh, because this, uh, we are talking about customers in oil and gas, uh, et cetera, and it is, we have found that it is super important for them. So it, re it is really important that uh, if we are choosing a cloud provider service, then they have uh, a, reputed, uh, a reputation in terms of security and uh, compliance in, other, in th those similar aspects. Now, one thing also is important to mind that once you start making solutions, if your customer is already associated with some kind of existing cloud solutions, then you have to be kind of compatible with them. So that's why it's kind of an important thing that if uh, you are picking off one of these off-the-shelf uh, providers, cloud providers, how, uh, what are the pitfalls you can encounter? So next I will say about the illustration, which is a predict anomalies. I'll talk about the modeling part of this uh, equipment monitoring based solution. Now let's take this example where uh, we have this uh, three temperature sensors in a coil, uh, in, in an alternator, and uh, the x-axis is time, so we have like uh, two weeks worth of data, and the y-axis is the temperature. Now the question is predict whether when the alternator winding coil would experience abnormal temperatures. And as we can clearly see in this kind of data, towards the end of the second week, uh, the coil, th uh, the green, the coil in the green color is clearly not behaving well. Now, without getting into too much of the modeling part, because I want to talk about the, the deployment aspect of it, let's just assume that we make this model, and people who are interested in knowing about how we make this model, like we can talk offline, but uh, the model that we eventually use is called a regression-based anomaly detection. Uh, in high-level terms, it basically means that uh, 
there are these three coils or these three sensor values that are going in sync with each other. You are trying to map the correlation of one sensor value with respect to the other uh, coils. And as soon as that correlation breaks, that is, you have to flag that that's problematic for us. So it's a very, that's why it's called a regression-based anomaly detection. You will regress uh, one sensor coil, one temperature on the other two. Now, we get into this pipeline of, uh, remember I showed you like there was a pre-processing step, there's a model prediction step, and there's a post-processing. We can kind of unpack that into this particular workflow. Like, assume that we are getting a one minute data from this particular equipment, and we need to do some pre-processing. In this case, it is resampling. And then we do a prediction of uh, where, at this given point of time, is it uh, anomalous or not? And then uh, we go into some post-processing where uh, we say that we compute the residuals of, residuals basically means that what I have predicted the temperature should be this, but now the actual temperature coil is this, so how far apart are we? And then we proceed uh, with some more post-processing and then we map it to our final, say zero or one, whether it's anomalous or not. Right? So is there any quick questions on this one? Uh, I can take. So let's just assume that this particular modeling feature uh, results in a binary, a pickle file of model, and we want to deploy this in the cloud. And this particular model will take the input data from the sensor and just output zeros or ones, whether it's in a bad state or a good state. Right? So the next, uh, I think this is where the major thing is, where the cloud service evaluation criteria uh, of the three GCP, Azure, and AWS. And so our goal is that if you want to perform a preliminary evaluation for deploying these uh, this pre-trained model, and we have a pickle file. So pickle is an uh, object, uh, a model object uh, file that uh, represents is already trained. And if you can wrap it with the pickle library of Python, then you can un unload this model and perform predictions on it. Now, what is our prior knowledge about the services? Um, if we take, like, assume that we don't have any knowledge about the service, we'll rely heavily on the online documentation that is available, meaning that uh, I will go, like, uh, develop custom model for AWS or develop custom model for GCP. That will be, like, a first stop for any newbie who wants to see which service to adopt. And this is what something we went by. We rely heavily on the online documentation. We spent a couple of days on each of these service, uh, meaning that we want a high speed to value not getting too much into this rabbit hole of uh, things that we might get into, like uh, security uh, roles, IAMs, et cetera. And we admit, we acknowledge that there can have been workarounds from what the solution that I'm going to present or the, we, what we have adopted, there can be workarounds around it. It's just that if given that this is the time and our skill set, are we able, which cloud provider is the, actually the best? Now. Within this, um, all these cloud providers uh, kind of advertise with respect to machine learning. They advertise that, uh, AW, so AWS says, okay, AWS SageMaker, you can build, train, and deploy models. That's the, if we just Google AWS SageMaker, that's what it says. And same thing with Azure, Azure ML. And uh, with GCP, it's ML Engine. So each of these service providers provide a machine learning specific kind of a, a workflow that you can adopt. And corresponding uh, Python-based SDKs are also available, which you can uh, do various tasks like deploying model or uh, deploying configurations and stuff like that. Right. Now, the overall deployment workflow is typically uh, kind of uh, similar in Azure and AWS GCP, but there are su subtle uh, changes. One is uh, no matter what, you connect your workspace, uh, your local environment to a one of these uh, accounts. And uh, now we, what you do is that uh, a mo so model is a kind of a concept that you need to register a model to the cloud and you kind of give information that what is your model name. And once you give that kind of information, you have an allocated space in the cloud saying that, okay, it's expecting this kind of a model will go in. So you register a model in Azure and you set up certain configurations uh, which says which environment uh, your model is going to run in, um, what are the resources uh, used, and so on. And then you deploy it. And similarly for AWS and GCP, uh, you have something like you connect to your workplace, workspace, 
But there is a small difference that uh, now you also need to actually create a storage in your uh, accounts, respective accounts, and you push your code to this storage. Uh, once you push this model files to the storage, then you register a model and you deploy. So there is a small difference in that kind of a workflow. So one next we'll go on to something called deployment scenarios. Uh, and here I want to talk about the fact that as an organization, when we receive some kind of a problem and we are trying to develop a solution for a use case, we start off with, say, simple models uh, which are off the shelf available in sklearn package in Python. And um, once we kind of make some initial assessments out of it, we kind of do some uh, more sophisticated workflows and wrap sklearn around some processing uh, techniques. And then as the code base becomes more and more sophisticated, you can actually make some like something like a custom package, which can either be proprietary or it can be like an open source package. So the as we go down in the model implementation or the kinds of uh, uh, modeling libraries that we use, we, in, we are increasing our domain specificity and the sophistication of our workflow. Now, given that this is uh, what we are going to do, we are going to have three kinds of models and uh, we'll try to fill it up like in each of this, how these cloud providers actually fare. Right? Uh, is there any quick question I can? Okay. Uh, let me say that uh, if we were to use a model with sklearn only, sklearn, uh, by this I mean that if we just unpack this particular component in this pipeline, which is uh, a model predict, a model predict is basically something like you have an object called model and you're running a prediction, like you're doing a model dot predict and giving your input values. Without doing any kind of a pre-processing, this is the most simplest case that anyone can do is just give whatever input it is and give it to the output. So without any pre-processing, how do these cloud services fare? The deploy scenario, let's just look at two codes of deployment. One is Azure and AWS. Uh, clearly the code does not fit in this block, so that itself is speaks like how much you actually have to code to get this done. On the other hand, if we see the GCP, uh, let's see how easy it is. Here we have a bucket name, which means that, uh, as I mentioned, for uh, Google Cloud, you need to push your model files to uh, a cloud storage. And th that's what they call it, a bucket. And uh, you give a name to your uh, bucket. Uh, regions are important because depending on where the servers are, it can kind of uh, have, you can have access to those particular uh, resources. And uh, we give a model name. And this particular fourth line, the GSUtil, is basically pushing, uh, is creating a bucket uh, in the cloud. And we are using successive codes to actually push our code to the cloud. And then we create a model resource. And then we proceed to actually deploy using this particular G Cloud uh, uh, API. And what, actually here, this is important that all these cloud providers provide a framework for these machine learning solutions. And Google Cloud, for example, provides something called a scikit-learn. So it already has these containerized systems where it kind of knows that uh, it has to use sklearn-based libraries uh, or, or the environment, and it's expecting that kind of a model. Now, there are some uh, certain very important things here is like in this particular, uh, while you're deploying to the uh, cloud, you, might, you would have uh, made your model in a local environment, and if that does not necessarily match the production environment, then you can run into trouble. So you have certain runtime versions uh, in each of these uh, services, and for example, Google Cloud has something called 1.14, and as a user, you must know that what that 1.14 consists, like which Python version it is, what are the machine learning libraries that it contains, and so on. And as you can also see, there's a Python version 3.5. So this is actually kind of also important that uh, as a developer, you will be developing uh, codes using the latest packages, but that may not be necessarily compatible with something that the best of the cloud solution provides. So there might have to make a modeling decisions around that, that yes, uh, I cannot code my, make my code in 3.6, I might also need 3.5 compatibility. Uh, I will just go to the same equivalent code of deploying a model in Azure and let's see um, AWS for first. 
So the same code uh, for AWS, we make, we have a bucket. AWS has this extra step, yep. Sorry? Yes, so you can use joblib as well, yeah. They give uh, typically pickle and joblib. So that that's why that, so that's why the, so pickle and joblib are the typical workflows most of them would use. If you want some kind of a customization on top of it, then things will start to break. So that is where I want to suggest that even for the simplest case like SK Learn, you might have to then go on to containerize systems and so on. And it that's a thing. so the same GCP that we saw in like probably ten lines of code in AWS. It has a similar workflow where you set up a storage. Now, one thing that I really found painful was in AWS, uh, you need to explicitly take care of the roles and uh, security and the credentials and so on. And it's kind of the documentation is really not that great around it. So I will show you some screenshots of where uh, I felt the problem with. But once you make a cloud storage, then you just uh, uh, tar your all the model files and you push that model file to the bucket. And once all your modeling files are available, you create a model object in the cloud. And as you can clearly see that too soon you are actually exposed to a very low level API compared to what I showed on GCP where the relevant information was good enough for my initial workflow. Now I'm suddenly exposed to this kind of API where I need to look back into what a model name could be, what is an execution role, a primary container. And like even if you're exposing stuff like this to your end user, I think it's very important that an equivalent level of documentation should also be available. And next, we, once you create a model, again, you deploy a model is two steps, which is you create something called an endpoint configuration, um, which shows, which uh, states that if you were to use a particular compute resource in the cloud, which one would it be? There are multiple instances. They call it like a T2, T1, etc., which basically is uh, how, what is the, configuration of my system, how much RAM does it have, how much memory does it have, et cetera. And um, variant, for example, to be frank, I don't know what all traffic variant name is. So that itself is something. Now, finally, create endpoint, you create an endpoint. So the same deployment stage in AWS looks like this. Now, just to showcase uh, quickly on the Azure component, the one thing that we found in Azure is that even though they uh, expose you a low level API, but it's kind of a reasonable level uh, to which that you can do some kind of a customization upfront. Meaning that in GCP, when I said that you give a runtime version of 1.14, you're kind of logged into that ecosystem of Python being 3.5 and SK, uh, scikit-learn package being 0 0.2, 0 0.2. But uh, a similar uh, workflow in Azure suggests that you can actually set up your own Python environment through a Conda framework. And this is actually pretty helpful because now, even though at step zero you have been exposed to low-level API, it's not that bad. And the other steps kind of remain the same, and uh, it's pretty readable if you just go through it, what's happening. So this is where I want to suggest that GCP gives you a high-level API throughout. Azure kind of gives you a low-level API, but it's manageable. AWS gives you very low level API, which is still not manageable, assuming that you're not a power user. If the, the story can be totally different that if you're a power user who's well, uh, like conversed with all these skills, then yes. So, yep. so uh, this is where uh, I kind of charted out in these three columns of uh, Easy to implement as per documentation for Azure GCP, but AWS clearly not uh, uh, simple. And with respect, respect to AWS, we'll come back to this particular component of how a simple search of which service to use actually kind of puts you into, you can use service A, you can use service B, you can use service C, and it kind of confusing. Um, all the three services make a very strong assumption that uh, you are going to call, if you're going to invoke an endpoint in the cloud, it is going to call dot .predict. So the question then becomes that if we were to wrap our model function with some pre-processing and post-processing, how can this dot predict function adapt to it 
so that we can do some kind of customization to it. Now, I already discussed about the different deployment environments uh, that uh, we see. Right? So one of the issues with AWS specifically is lack of uniform, again, documentation. It pushes you towards containers too soon. And uh, this is where I did a simple search of deploy custom models on AWS. And on the left-hand side, you see this kind of a page where it takes you to AWS. And if you read this red one, it kind of starts to tell, oh, you should do containers, and you should have, this is a tutorial on containers, and so on. So this is step zero for AWS. And if we do dig a bit, uh, if we uh, dig a bit deeper into the code base of SageMaker, you'll find certain notebooks that people have made, uh, which can take you till one point of time, but then you will soon run into errors because these notebooks are not being either adapted to the recent uh, libraries. So one such example is where I created a S3 bucket in the cloud, and I just tried to push my code into the cloud. A very simple operation, step zero. And I soon see this error that I do not have permissions to do so. And there is no documentation that says that uh, what, how you should solve this problem, unless as a diligent user, we would go to Stack Overflow, and we will see this a common problem which came three years, eight months ago, and still active in eight months. So it's a very recurrent problem, even still. And we go up dig bit further, I find that within the S3 bucket, you have something called the permissions. Within permissions, you have something called the bucket policy. And once you create this, click this bucket policy, you'll come into this thing, which is a policy generator. And within this policy generator, now you will be like, okay, what the hell is principle? What is ARN? And so on. And you get, you, it's, it's all this is solvable if you're a power user. But the same code when I showed in GCP and Azure, I was not exposed to this kind of stuff. So this is one pain point. Now, that, that, that does not mean there are not pain points in other ones. There are certain pain points. And for example, in Google Cloud, I mentioned that there is this runtime operation of 1.14 that you provide. And that uses Python 3.5 and a particular scikit-learn. Now, it, what consider a scenario where your local model development uses latest Python packages, but these, Google, uh, these cloud providers are not ready for it. And you will run into this error. Uh, with this is one example where my sklearn package uh, for 3.5 was not compatible, and it just says that, oh, sklearn dot linear model dot underscore rich is not found. Now, if you dig into the scikit-learn code, you will see that between the 0 0.21 and 0 0.22, the API actually significantly changed. So that's what is one lesson learned is that know where you're going to deploy a priori so that uh, you can make coding decisions around your production code as well in upfront. So this is, again, the key takeaways is the common problem is which service to use. Um, I already discussed new production environment. And uh, pickle files must be compatible to your production environment. Um, one common thing is that the ML workflows offered are easy to use for simple cases because these pack, uh, all these ML workflows that the cloud providers are given do the simplistic use cases. And any slight going out of their kind of a comfort zone is really problematic. Now, GCP versus Azure versus AWS, uh, I think I've already talked that they give a very high-level API, but AWS does not. So any, com any takes on this? Any questions around this? Okay. So next outline is let's take this simple model, and let's say we want to do a customization that, oh, this model should take some kind of a transformed input and should transform the output. And in this one, I'm doing this entire pipeline purely through a scikit-learn Python library. Now, one thing that is kind of good, a positive thing is that all services like Azure and GCP kind of acknowledge that you might have to do this operation and give you this facility, a kind of a customization through some uh, mechanism. Azure, for example, gives you something called a score.py and a score file. A score file is basically where you can wrap this predict function before and after you can put all your pieces of code around this. And similarly, Google Cloud provides a class, uh, exposes a class to you called the predictor class, where you can do the same. And for AWS, there was no direct way, and it, you have to move to uh, containers. Um, and this is the documentation that acknowledges it. It clearly says so. And same thing happens for GCP. However, to note for GCP is that this kind of, if you want some customization in your model prediction, it is in a beta version, but it is still workable. 
Um, and AWS, the documentation takes you to do containerization. And this is what the class actually looks like. It's not, uh, I hope it's readable. Uh, this is my, uh, my original Python, so this is a class where I can customize my prediction function. My original prediction function was just something like outputs this model dot predict, but now I can wrap it up with whatever I want over here, and I can do some kind of post-processing and return it. Now the only change that will happen is how do you communicate that this particular class should uh, basically, uh, this particular class to be indicated in the deployment stage. So in the deployment script, your Google Cloud, everything remains the same, except you just give an extra argument that there is this predictor class, and that's it. The customization is done. So without much of change with single line, I got my tasks still done. Now, let's, uh, I'll just go through this fast, and I would say that, let's say that we have made a very sophisticated code, and this is particular code which we call ADTK, Anomaly Detection Toolkit, which has a specific task of doing uh, anomaly detection in this time series data. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, Tyler Wen gave a talk about this, and uh, these are the, some model description of what it does. Now the question is, if you want not to use scikit-learn packages, but our own cu custom packages, how well would it do? For sake of time, I will skip this, but we can talk offline about this particular model. Um, it turned out that it was still actually possible to use custom models through Azure and GCP, from the customizations that they provide. Specifically, Azure gave you a score.py, and GCP gave you a, a predictor class. The only thing that uh, I think I want to reiterate is that uh, when this ADTK was developed, there was a point where ADTK was 3.6 version. And then the question becomes, uh, okay, you cannot actually host this on these any cloud providers, and we made a 3.5 uh, compatible ADTK. I'm not saying that, is what, that was the decision point, but I'm just po po trying to say that their, your production side of the code can get affected. Like you might have to make decision points before of which Python version your code should be in. And uh, this is the class uh, where I, my predictor class just gets affected, um, which is my outputs is model.detect. Everything remains the same, actually. And just for something like if you want more details about which runtime versions are compatible with it, which ones, they have a very good uh, documentation here. Um, one thing I've noticed, I don't know if it's a coincidence, or I don't know why, is that runtime version is the same as the TensorFlow version. So if I'm using 1.13 or 1.14, here it will be 1.14. So I'm still not sure how, why they have actually done that kind of runtime thing. So I would go to the, uh, Final remark is that the documentation is super important while we are doing this. We need a high speed to value, um, and uh, we need easy configurations of IAM rules, et cetera, as a data scientist. And allowing customizations by high level API as much as possible is preferable. That does not mean that we don't want to go into low level, but it's just that the transition from high level to low level can be much smoother. Um, and this is where it's like the question then, I think most of my slides, like 30% of the slides will be like, there is an issue with this, there's an issue with that. But I would like to end in a positive note, like saying that uh, we were able to successfully deploy these models on two of the providers, and that's actually a very uh, positive thing, very good thing. Uh, and they are very useful services that we must all use. The question is just then how much do you want to go out of your comfort zone and learn new things and make, uh, make it possible to do. So that's it from my side, yeah. Let me know if there are any questions. Questions? So, so in summary, you had your best experience with, uh, with uh, GCP, Google Cloud, or? Yes. GCP and Google Cloud has the best experience, and uh, e they are both equally important according to what you, how much customization you need. Can we get your slides and notebooks that you showed us? Um, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, thanks, everyone. Oh, everyone. Sorry. No thanks. <laughs> I'm. I'm
a little bit more familiar with AWS, and I always get this feeling, you know, like, like looking over the fence, it's like so many stuff like Google Cloud and Azure, it just seems like a lot more streamlined, um, like you know, just easier. Um, what, how would you compare the two, like for deploying these models, like what are the pros and cons between Azure and GCP? Oh, between Azure and GCP? Yeah, so, th so between Azure and GCP, it's frankly a tough choice because both were equally um, easy to do. It's uh, because if you go by pure number of lines of code, that is not indicative. As long as even if the code is long, but you understand what's happening, then it's fine. Um, I like, uh, for Azure, I really like that at a very beginning stage, they give you this uh, thing of given Anaconda environment that you want to provide. Because if you are used to making a virtual or Anaconda environment, it becomes then easy to do so. For GCP specifically, you'll have to use a runtime version 1.14. It's kind of the other way. Like you can start off with something and provide to G uh, Azure and they will adhere to it. But for GCP, you see what is in 1.14, you adhere to it and then it happens. So, but um, both are equally helpful. So um, I haven't heard you say anything about price, how much uh, cost. Um, yeah, so price is something uh, where uh, this is like even before stage, like we, we are, let's say price is not a concern and we just want speed to value because um, there are other ways your price can get affected, meaning that if you are really spending so all your resources and time on a service that is bad, then again, that time has to be mapped to price as well. So once we find this kind of a mapping of how much time you save, then I think the next step would be that, oh, is it still financially viable to do so? Yeah. Um, do you have any other impact in terms of uh, the, the other side, let's say database, that you probably have to make a, a decision on which provider you, you're going to work with? Uh, is that also making an impact later on in? in terms of uh, which service specifically you are going to use? So in terms of database, uh, like what's- In terms of uh, all the, where the data from all this equipment is being streamed and where you're storing it. And right. uh, perhaps you're using one of those services, but uh, having, having made that decision later on will impact the decision of where you're running, whether you have to marry with the uh, Azure or C GCP or AWS. Right, right. So this is actually the, um, yeah, this is a kind of a tricky thing of uh, if you want to do storage and databases, um, it depends upon which uh, setting you're working. And if you're working as an organization, like for us, uh, we uh, and sometimes encounter customers who already have association with a particular kind of uh, these cloud providers. So if that is the case, then yes, you might have to work around with that. If that is not the case, if you're looking for open-ended thing, which one to use, um, this particular talk that I did, we did not do that kind of assessment. Um, frankly, yeah, we, we need to do more. Uh, but I, as far as I know, like Amazon has S3, Google has their own Google storage. Um, seeing the overall documentation in general uh, of any use, I really like Google's documentation. So it seems usable. Uh, one quick question here. AWS and all other cloud service for providers are, uh, have this very robust security aspects to it. So it's all about roles and permissions. Right? Yeah. Right? Uh, I have myself you know, spawned many clusters and had a uh, lot of Docker containers running everywhere and sending data and finally getting the answers. Uh, if done properly by the admin guys to, you know, when, when a user spawns a, you know, spawns a cluster, you don't, the user doesn't need to go around and start tinkering with IAM roles and permissions here and there, yes, give, give access to S3 buckets to this EC2 instance yes. and stuff like that. It doesn't have to do, once you spawn, the system, the whole cloud, that, that, uh, that environment knows that this is the user, based on his role, he has access to these seven services and stuff like that, right? right. Once that is done, then it's kind of very seamless for doing all your operations rather than going around mucking around all with all those things, right? right? With that in mind, have you compared among these three services, like which, which one of them is kind of very easy path from experiment to production? Yep. 
So uh, setting aside the part of roles as well, that is totally valid because given the same, like if you tell me that deploy a AWS instance right now, since for me everything is configured, yes, that part is ma managed easily. Now, the answer to the question would be I would still use either Azure or GCP uh, because that the third criteria where the third modeling aspect deployment scenario which I, where I mentioned that we have our custom package uh, what is our take or how easy it is to deploy a custom package to the cloud? This does not consider roles or IAMs or anything. And clearly, there is no direct way in AWS because you have to start moving to containers and uh, that kind of a system. Um, so the, the question then becomes is, uh, are you comfortable with the, that kind of, do you, are, uh, is it acceptable for you to go in that and learn that thing? Any other questions here? Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. Good hand. Thank you.